Kukosha mikono yangu juu Naisifu nchi yangu marufu Nanyosha mikono yangu juu Naisifu nchi yangu marufu Hello, hello Tanzania Hello Kind of Clarifying, strengthening, taking forward the uh, uh, limitless opportunity. Mike, I'm here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have this one. Uh -huh. So I, we've got quite used with it, and that is probably the habit and the routine of thinking that the idea of smart partnership, if you have put it like this, and the idea of bigger smart partner does not need to be um, reminded all the time. But in fact, um, each time we are bringing it in, actually, is different. The same and different. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the reason why, as a core group of active smart partners, those here and those who are actually probably joining us on the live webcast, which we'll uh, offer you uh, this morning again. Um, that's the reason why each year, at the end of the year, we're trying to see if the smart partnership has such different shapes, different meanings, while the same. So, and that's the reason why the smart partnership movement's dialogues are so essential every year. And that's the reason why smart partnership dialogues are not, it's easy to say why they are not. They are not conferences, they are not this, they are not that. And it's difficult to those who come in new to understand what it is. And I don't think we can articulate very easily without a bit more uh, kind of uh, each year uh, contribution on the, towards the strategic uh, framework of the smart partnership different the perspectives that we come from. Uh, you have seen in this uh, uh, ad kind of agenda also a page which which had what is called multiple perspectives. Which I haven't referred to because I thought you don't need to refer to them. So you just notice and probably one picks up the point. But I think it's worthwhile mentioning that about ten years ago or so, the way smart partnership came about in an operative way and then we realized what we are doing was uh, when uh, particularly his excellency president Serveni had a think tanking uh, first think tanking that he organized he asked to be organized uh, and he wanted to press about the fact that people need to come freely and articulate their own way of cooperating with each other from their own where they come from. The language they speak, that's why we have smart partnership translated, the smart partnership referred to in Swaziland, in uh, how is it, Lomkosi? Kusharyana right? Right, right. In, uh, in uh, in Lesotho, what do we say? Uh, 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 Mampa. Uh, and so on and so on. The Pacheria Intelligenza. So it's not a translation. It's actually what it does happen. And the way it's being expressed, this smart partnership, within different contexts. And, and uh, that's the reason why I was actually, we, were, we are using Yanir. Yanir has never been coded to you so much uh, here and all over. We are using Yanir as a point of reference. Uh, yesterday when we finished, I requested him to refer again to culture. Because the culture is tradition, the culture is feeling good on uh, kind of uh, uh, trying to say cooperation, not in a UN style, but uh, or Commonwealth uh, Fund for Technical Cooperation style, but in the way people just naturally behave, and probably we could make them aware that they could 
be more efficient and more uh, reliable. Yeah. Uh, so 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 there is a very very kind of very specific task we undertake as a group here, um, which cannot be face to face, which cannot be undertaken by those who are as far as possible joining us virtually and not by those to whom we are going to transmit this in writing, the uh, outcome. But uh, so it's very, we only have another half a day and then we have the uh, annual general meeting, which in itself is an expression of the smart energy movement having the formal face the formal the co the, in relation to the common set of government and uh, the next year annual general meeting will take place after the common set of government which will be in Malta so we have a very great responsibility of trying to transmit for the third year <coughs> uh, achievements in the Commonwealth to the common set of government uh, an articulation about what it is that a CPTM not that they, they've done as a report but what is it that there is in the Commonwealth that uh, because we can't just say CPTM limited as a company or smart partnership movement as dialogue so it's a very great responsibility we have for the next half a day that we are here, and for the second half, uh, we'll uh, do our formal uh, requirements for the legitimacy uh, <coughs> that we have. Now, there was uh, um, uh, yesterday morning before Yanni comes in, there was a bit of a uh, kind of introduction that would have been made by um, some and a shock simply to kind of uh, point out a little bit of, uh, 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 about what is it that we are missing or we want to add more through Yanir's very kind introduction and participation in the last week with us this time. So Ashok, do you want to kind <coughs> of come in? <coughs> I think what is uh, common amongst all of us, here or on the web or anywhere, we are at a stage where uh, different communities and societies are now configured as a state. Now what is this configuration is some kind of a system. <coughs> On one hand, it has to behave like a state with a democratic setup or whatever setup. On the other, this configuration of the system, no matter what, to financial transactions, to market interventions, to trade and so on, has to connect <coughs> with other such configurations. So the first thing is that the recognition that there is a need, we have, we have come to a stage where one has to go to the next stage, means that we realize that there is some kind of a limitation in the configuration that we are in. This realization itself means that we want to move out of this limit. Now, each one whether it's as an individual or <coughs> as a part of an organization, part of the government or part of the business, is faced with this context. That you are working in a configuration which is a nation state, a nation state, a system which is connected with outside. Now, the ability to say that I have a limitation and yet I want to get out, requires uh, in a sense self-learning mm -hmm. because you know your context whether it's a government context whatever and you have to come out of it I think what smart partnership does is essentially to say okay you are not the only one in this dilemma 
this dilemma is common to <coughs> all of us and the best way of learning to get out of this dilemma making it limitless so to say is to see the experiences of others so smart partnership to me it appears is the only forum is the only setup you want to call it a system want to call it whatever organization but it's basically a uh, an approach a movement which provides this opportunity of self learning that's why we say it's a free exchange of ideas as omar put it it's kind of a free to trade of ideas and it's not a uh, intellectual exchange the very fact that we are exchanging experiences in an open way the purpose of this is so that we can overcome the limitation that we individual are facing whether in governance whether for financial inclusion and so on so each of these targets provide us with a in a sense a nucleus around which we exchange ideas it does not mean that the exchanging of experiences and ideas is only for that particular channel financial inclusion so these these are like the the paths traversing which you learn to overcome limitations <laughs> uh, over the years we have found that this approach of sharing around particular issues has enabled organizations government private sector even ngos and so on to learn to cope with changing situations this changing situation may be called innovation it could be triggered through technological change it can be triggered through ebola it can be triggered through anything the fact is that we now say that this configuration which is the system is connected it's not in isolation almost everywhere people are trying to come out of the limitations face with the ebola whether it's the trade whether it's the financial crisis and we are not alone in this i personally believe that there is no other such approach of making this what we call a complex system of complex identities connected with other complex identities the complexity word only says that please understand that you are not alone you may not know the specific connections how you get affected by others but the only way <coughs> to deal with this limits of complexity <coughs> is to self learning there is no other way and i think that's what to me it appears is the crux <coughs> that yes we are in a complex situation everybody feels it's very complicated we don't understand but the only way out of it is to become a self learning entity and this facility of becoming a self learning system please understand that when we say system we are not talking of a a a rigid bounded system we are simply saying the 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 way people come together that's that's a system 
and uh, that to me is smart partnership. That's why I say smart partnership means free exchange of ideas. Smart partnership means you should be have empathy with others. Smart partnership, you understand the context, the culture behind which the other entities are working. So, it, it, I think it's the, the meaning of the term is not literal, but is indicative. So the smart partnership principles are indicative of the way the <coughs> systems <coughs> work. That's my understanding yeah. of smart partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you. I mean, uh, we, we, we don't want, I don't know if you have during the year when you are, or you have it with yourself or in your computer or however, it's really like. But uh, it is probably if you, th there are a few pages and a few things that I'm told regularly that they are being coached, that, that, that they are, they are extremely relevant to everything. They can be used uh, in whatever context, from a, a kind of Rolls Royce or in a university in Manchester, this Graffin Institute that we went to last week, Friday, only uh, by, by in very real time kind of situations, they are referring to this. And uh, uh, yeah, I put usually, I underline and put some flags, what I think. So, I thought it might be useful while you listen to Yanir to try to see if we can integrate the kind of things Yanir is trying to make us kind of reflect on. You integrate or relate to what it is in this to make it even more uh, kind of, uh, not to change it, but to take it forward. Uh, just very, very quick, how, do you, how does Bakiga say, I mean the language, we were talking before Yanir come about there's a movement, the smart punish movement as a word still expresses what probably the more global context wants to understand that we are putting forward to them. And uh, uh, we have this problem since we started, actually, our group. How do you explain what it is? Because we don't have words, there are new words, new concepts. But so. Uh, usually, uh, some goes into Bakiga, but maybe you explain what is Bakiga? Thank oh, you, Nada. That's Bakiga. <coughs> Bakiga, that's my wife. It means people of the hills. So, <coughs> we are fascinated by things tall, things high, and things robust. Yeah. So, whenever I send me I, uh, an email, I also send her typical particular saying which is relates to the subject. And she asked me, can I pick one which is relevant for our system? So I mean, I'm not it. reading what you're saying in the email. I'm no, just no, saying, I'm not saying as Bachiga says always. So as the Bachiga say this about trees on top of the hill, they are fascinated by it. You know where the plant trees on the top or over the hill. It's the wind breakers really. The purpose is not defined. <laughs> so the, the concept that comes out of this is uh, collectivity without a clearly defined purpose. But somehow it's not working. It serves so many purposes you can't define the purpose it's a single. Now the thing that comes to my mind is to do with a tree. The machine always fascinated why a tree grows tall. If you're a tall person, if you're mm -hmm. tall like mm -hmm. say like but they like to general <laughs> They I say, are you growing tall to bring down the rain <laughs> from the sky? <laughs> <laughs> so the fascination was that the trees are they, they are not the same height. They all grow tall. They are not competing, not visibly. You don't know what they are doing, but somehow they seem to be assisting. They, they are together. Nice. And, and the saying which puts these together, these with a the tree, it says now, I think you both can understand that. Because I was talking to her about angry. She said, angry is in our language. That means a leopard. So, did you understand that program? Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 
Taj rigu. Literally translated means there are no roots. There are no, there is no truth. There are no leaves. Uh, there are no branches. There is no sky. <coughs> they are all there, and they seem to be integrated. But the purpose is not clear. This is really what he says. There is no difference between them. If you take one mm -hmm. of them, the system somehow is disturbed, is destabilized. But they are not the same. So they are connected, but the connectivity is not defined. Yeah. To me, that's probably really what defines it, our, yeah. our movement. We are, we are the sky, so high, to limitless, and there's a tree trying to get there, and the branches, and trees, I mean the leaves, the branches, <coughs> the trunk, and the roots. And the Bachiga said, there's no difference. They are all doing something. You cannot put your finger on it. And you don't know what it is, but it's a system. That if you take away one, then the system will be stable. I suppose if, if Yanir wouldn't be here with us, I would open to one of these pages and say that's what probably systems mean. So Yanir, I mean, we are not advertising for his book <laughs> <laughs> because he's here with us. It's just that he needs to know that all these various books were around. They are not by me only. They are actually integrated in what we do. And this is not a library as such. It's an inverted comma, a library of ideas and people. That's what we're saying. But then, anyway, here is what actually otherwise Bachiga says. So if you know that, we need to add it, if you publish anyone, what Bachiga says, Absolutely. that the system is. Actually, she has compiled them, right? You know, hand out for yesterday. Yes. Yeah, actually, if you look into the yeah. Bachiga's collection that we have in the last. Uh, is, is, is a treasure in the last kind of 10 years ten, or so. Yeah, ten years. Yeah? It's a language of smart partnership in a Bachiga way. Yes, but every, every one of these statements I mean, says something about us. Kind of say something, yeah. you can pick another one at random. Say, Mind uh, you. Otai, otai, yeah. But those who cannot be here are also together with us. Is it that? That, that, yes. Otai, otai, they have not refused to come, but they are with us. So in other words, so, if you try to <coughs> learn the Bachiga language, it might be as complex as reading this book. <laughs> but uh, he translates it to us, and I think he's like, I already speak Bachiga now, after 10 years. <laughs> we don't I speak systems, but let's listen what he says. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I very much appreciate that uh, introduction. I do think that there is a very deep sense in which traditional wisdom, not knowledge, but really wisdom, is uh, about systems, uh, about how things depend on each other, um, and that we are beginning using the science of complex systems to expose um, what that means to understand those things. So, um, uh, what, what I'm going to do now is is really just actually not talk about systems thinking in general, um, but about specifically the issue of economic development. Um, but you. but um, <laughs> I just remind you uh, what we talked about yesterday, and we talked about that there is a lot of data in the world, and we don't want to just look at how one thing correlates with another or alternative two other things correlate with each other. We really want to understand how things work across all the information that we can obtain about the system. Um, and, and in some sense, it's like putting a puzzle together. This is an amusing <coughs> picture of a, a field that was one time planted in, in New York City, basically. Um, but the idea of the of the linkage between people and and, and crops and urban environments and how everything works together is something that um, uh, we want to understand. So we're trying to build this systems view, and in order to do this, we use data, which is really about the past, of course, to understand the dependencies that exist in the system. Um, and, and that's what gives us 
It's the dependencies, once we understand. Um, and once we understand the dependencies, then we can talk about what is going to happen in the future. Um, and in particular, um, it's really about understanding cascades that occur through the system, um, crises, and, and leverage points. The key of leverage points is how do we decide what we want to do and make it happen. So when we have a complex dependent system, we all, I'm sure, have the experience of, of, of uh, thinking that a certain action will have a certain effect, and it may have a completely different effect, may even have the opposite effect of what one intends. Um, uh, and so by understanding the dependencies, the patterns of behavior of the system, uh, we can change that to really being figuring out what's the right place to push on the system in order to get what we want. Um, and so I'm going to apply this now to development policy. So let me give you a little bit of the background of this. Um, yesterday I spoke briefly about our work on the food crisis. I mentioned a little bit about the financial crisis. We have a bunch of papers about the financial crisis, about <coughs> dependencies among banks and the rest of the, of the economy, about the European bond crisis, um, uh, a lot of different parts of the financial crisis, which I didn't talk about yesterday. Um, in the aftermath of doing that work, uh, we spoke with part of the UN called the Common Fund for Commodities. And we discussed that we would develop an understanding of how commodity volatility, which is really what they care about, is impacting on development. Now, uh, I don't think, I don't know if anybody is not aware that the prices of commodities have gone down recently. That's something that we knew was going to happen. Um, but um, uh, the question is understanding how this links to development in not a trivial way. Um, and in order to do that, we have to develop a framework for understanding development, economic framework. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So I'm going to explain where we are in this. And, and before I talk about it, let me just say what is the traditional economic framework for development. It's the, quote, Washington Consensus, which a little bit caricature is this but not that much caricature, actually, right? The idea is that if you make free markets and open borders, everything will work. There's no dynamics here. There's no, how do you get here, there, from here? Um, and uh, the experience is not that good with this description. Um, so uh, how do we develop our understanding? And I, I'm going to give you the, the end result here. Um, so I'm going to explain the structure and how <coughs> I want to get there. The first point is that we really need to understand how financial flows work in the system. Where are the flows taking place? And I'll explain how that works. Um, and we have to understand the positive and negative roles of boundaries. So open boundaries is not the only answer. Excuse boundaries me. play an important Excuse role. It, it, your uh, this document, are we going to be able to get this? We don't want to no, all this, right this is, <coughs> you can scribble as much as you want, but I cannot give you this. It's not published yet. So you oh. guys are, are privy to secret information right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not kidding you. We do not reveal information until it's published, usually. <coughs> uh, this is a special occasion where we're sharing this. This is a process of being written up. As soon as it's published, which will be within months, I'll be happy to share it with you, but this is privileged information. Um, and, uh, and, and, and please uh, respect it as such. Yeah, Neil, were we to add smart ownership here and there, would we be part of that policy? <laughs> 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 because we are a solving goal. That's, anyway, let's go on. I, actually, there's Thank a you. very yeah. more direct way. The reason why I'm discussing this. And this is really true. I wouldn't discuss it were it not that we have a very specific agenda. Yeah. Um, I would <coughs> like to partner with you. That's okay. what, yeah. so that's and I way. want to explain that. I'm going to get to that at the end. 
but there's a real now current opportunity for partnership in order to take this to the next step. But it has to be a smart partnership. Absolutely. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's... let's um, uh, but there's a really specific reason that I would like to share this with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and otherwise I wouldn't, because it's not yet published. The, the third Thank piece you. of this uh, that I'm going to talk about is the role, indeed, of volatility in investment, which we all understand intuitively, probably, but the formalization of that has not really been done. Um, and uh, the final statement is that in order to be able to implement the policy, unlike the Washington consensus, we have to understand specific country needs. Uh, we cannot specify the policy until we do the analysis. And that's the next step. Okay, so we haven't done the realization of policy recommendations because we can't yet. We need the information. We'll talk about that. So I want to start this discussion from something very basic in economics. Um, uh, this is something that you will find in, at the beginning of any economics textbook. It's also something that is eventually ignored in economics because they ignore the dynamics. But this is just how economic flows work. <coughs> Firms pay wages to households. This is uh, just a distortion of the translation that we have to do to get this on the screen here. And then there's spending. The important thing is that this is a cycle. Okay. <coughs> These things don't separate. If you don't have one flow, you cannot have the other flow. This is a really crucial piece of information. What about taxes? What? Taxes. Taxes. Okay. This is only one piece of the picture, yeah. right? That's but this question. idea of cyclicity has to always be present. If money accumulates somewhere, <coughs> the economy doesn't. Okay? Um, taking it one step further, I'm not going to quite get to where you want to go, but here, um, there are, we can separate labor and capital. That L is supposed to be up with a capita, so it's capital, right? Um, and so there's spending and wages. And then there's investment and returns. And these are different kinds of financial flows. Because one is a transfer and the other one is a transfer of ownership, which is different. Okay? So we have to understand this structure. Um, what I want to do is take this one step further. And this is the framework that I'm going to talk about. Okay? This is the economic framework. It's not exactly what we will use in application, so your question is relevant here because we want to understand more flows like taxation. Um, but I just want to illustrate the ideas, okay? So this is about separating the economy into three different sectors, just for simplicity. There's an agricultural sector, there's an extractive sector, and there's a manufacturing and service sector, okay? Each of these sectors has flows associated with capital and wages and purchases, okay? So it's just more lines representing what we had before because now I have three different sectors. There's also transfers of payments for between the sectors. There's also exports and imports. So this outer boundary represents the outside world. And so we have flows. This is a financial flow of products being exported, resulting in financial flows going into the system. This is a purchases um, that are resulting in inflow of products from the outside. Is that clear? Yeah. Ask questions now. If you, if you have questions about how I'm doing this, ask it now, because this is the crux of what I'm working So you yeah, yeah, the financial services, which is massive, it comes from more than manufacturing in many countries. Where do you categorize that? Their services. services. <coughs> we can ask, we can in principle include them in services, or we could separate them out. But one of the key things is the investment. 
And this is the investment flow. So here you have capital. Here you have investment Must flows. And, and the point of this is to go back again to a simple view of an economy as formed out of these three sectors. And to the extent that we need to represent other kinds of flows, that's what we would do if we want to understand a particular system. Right now, I'm trying to illustrate the ideas using this kind of structure. Right? May I also yes. ask, I mean, when you say the conventional productivity function, then there is a residual called technology, um, which is not, there's no residual here. We, we don't have to represent technology. What we are, are representing is just the economic money flows themselves. Money flows. That's right. Money. That's right. It's a question of what we're choosing okay. to represent, and this is what we're choosing yes. to represent. Yes. It's an important question. Yes. But all the three be in the co in, 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 com integrated, or can you survive with agriculture? Or? You know, what, what, we're do, what I'm doing here, and this, this is exactly the right question, this is a, 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 a framework that I'm now going to ask, how does a particular country behave? Yeah. Okay? And, and so this question about what happens if you have just agriculture or if you have just um, extractive industries, oil industries, or mine, uh, other forms of mining, uh, this is exactly what we're going to do next. Yeah. So how does intellectual capital and value flow mm -hmm. around your mm -hmm. system? Mm -hmm. um, intellectual capital is something that modifies the nodes of this system, but it influences the behavior of the dynamics, but is not uh, represented. What I'll show you is there's a specific kind of question that we're trying to ask here. The specific kind of question has to do with the structure of the transaction system. I accept the question. It's a very important I think what, what we wanted to say from this, we are referring to intellectual equity in smart partnerships. We're saying... Yeah. When I take one more step forward, you'll see what we'll I'm asking. Okay. Yeah. So for purposes of no, this let's discussion, let's is this... I, I, uh, what I want to be clear is what it is that I am representing. The fact that I'm not representing everything about society is appropriate. Mm -hmm. it's a, it, it has to do with one of the questions that I'm going to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll see that in a minute. Yes. Yeah, for purposes of this, this discussion, are we to think of this as a, an open system or a closed system? Okay. Open and closed are often a confused mm. issue. Mm. This is an open system because there is an outside world <laughs> to which yeah. it is coupled. Yeah. In this case, frame yeah. of reference, we're thinking about this as a country yeah. coupled to the global economy yeah. Yeah. through the financial flows to the boundary. Yeah. What, what is more <coughs> subtle, the, the, the key thing, remember, that I'm trying to capture here is the role of cyclicity. Okay, everything that modifies parts of the system that don't engage the cyclicity, I don't need to include in the picture. That's why I'm not including intellectual capital, I'm not including technology, because that's not actually affecting the cyclicity. Yes? Uh, I will explain. Uh, yes? Why households and not name and not people? Oh, so, why how very good question. The point is the following. If I just said labor and capital, Okay. Say people. People. You can call it people. Instead of household. You can call it people if you want. I think we do, need, we, do, we do need to know where he's getting that. Yeah. 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 Let me, I'll go on in a moment. But we're just talking about people. There is an important issue here, which is that in principle, in many societies, labor and capital are separate, right? There's a group of people that are labor, a group of people that are capital. But that's not fundamental. So the model allows for both to be incorporated in the same individuals, okay? All right. So let me now take examples of economic systems. Um, the first one is a subsistence agriculture. Subsistence agriculture doesn't involve financial flows, so all I'm doing is representing it here as separate, really, from what we talked about. Um, what I want to do <coughs> is to let's look at what happens if we have a, uh, an economy that's dominated by an extractive industry. And this is often the case in developing countries or in uh, uh, 
countries today. Um, what's happening here is we have the extractive industry and we have a financial flow into this arising from the exports. What happens to the money once it comes into the system? It goes out. Okay? Here is going out in the case of um, uh, where capital that owns the industry is something that is, the owners are outside the system, right? They're foreign owners, so we have capital flow going back out. There's reinvestment, uh, which is a small flow. There's a small amount of labor expense in the country. Um, this labor is then going out of the country due to what? Due to the fact that there is no, very little manufacturing and services in the country. The import. So this is the imports. Now, the key thing about this structure is notice that there is no cycles in the country. <coughs> in fact, the internal economy is very weakly coupled to anything that's going on. Does this sound familiar? Yes. Okay. So notice that this representation captures directly this issue of the fact that an extractive industry that is basically coupled to the global economy but has very little to do with the domestic economy really doesn't give rise to development in the, moment, in the way we would think about it. Is that clear? Now we might have a slight lot of, so, so this is the money coming in goes out of the system. That's the primary flow. Would there be some rental income coming into the country as a result of this? So if the ownership is inside the country, that's represented here. If the ownership is inside the country, then the flows will come in, but again, the capital will go out for investment in foreign markets. And again, is even though it came in to the country, it doesn't stay. It flows out. Excuse me. Yes. Um, can you elaborate in the case of uh, multinational companies? In what? Multinational companies. Well, the you use the cheap labor in most of the developing countries? Mm -hmm. So the point is that when the cheap labor, the payment for labor is happening, the question is where does the flow go from there? And the answer is if most of it goes to imports, then the flow goes out of the country. So what we see is that in this case, notice that the flows come in and go out and don't cycle within the country. Is that clear? Does this make sense? You know it well, exactly. So now if I had an agriculturally based economy, which was a cash crop economy, we would have a very similar picture, only going through agriculture. So I've illustrated here the case where ownership is in the country. It might also be, we could illustrate the case of ownership outside the country. But again, the cash flows in to get the product to the cash crop. Um, but then it goes through investment out of the country. The labor pay, uh, that goes in is also going out. So again, we have flows that go in and out of the country. What do we want? Okay, so let's look at what a, a, um, uh, an emerging economy looks like. So in an emerging economy, we have imports the exports that are giving rise to cash flow in, but inside the country there's labor that is buying and there is capital that is being reinvested in the country. So notice that the flows are six cycles inside the country. Is that clear? Why? Because if we have cyclical flows inside the country, this is the mechanism by which economic progress takes place why improvements in welfare are happening. Now, when we have flows through the global economy, it is a global economy cycle, but it doesn't create diversified economic activity within the country. Is that clear? You know it well, right? This is not surprising. 
But the point is that this is the way to capture it in this representation. So what do we need? We need closed loops of production and, and consumption within the country that con consists of both investment flows and manufact you know, purchases, right? So, so investment and purchases of domestic products with, and coupled to them wages and returns from domestic products. Is that clear? Yes. And this is what gives rise not just to economic activity, but diversified economic activity. So let's go back to the standard policy advice. The standard policy advice is free markets and open borders, which is coupling the country economy, the global economy, for those very, very few things that the country can compete in the global economy. Is that clear? But if other products of the domestic economy are going to be overwhelmed by the imports in within the context of the strong global economy that is producing those goods. Now, which is good? And the answer is, well, we need both. But they need to be somehow balanced in the right way. So instead of having this kind of economy where things flow out, we really want to have, so, so the point is that this is the natural outcome. It's the direct result. Like a you know, mathematical theorem, you created these policies, you ended up with this result. So if you see this a lot, it shouldn't be surprising because this is what we asked for. By creating the policies, that are being uh, advocated. Isn't that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay, does that want to make sense? Yes. Okay. Excuse me. Yeah. Would, would that picture change <coughs> if uh, you were to have um, local investors in the. Well, again, the reason why people invest is because they'll get the highest returns. And it's not enough to have just investment. You have to have investment in purchases and manufacturing. You have to have the whole cycle. So you have to create all of the pieces of the cycle. This is it. Remember, we have to have all of these pieces in order to make it work. So you're saying, what if we had this or this one? We have this one. And the answer is, well, we need that one. And the, the, the investment has to be returned. And we need to have this. So if you say, I'm going to add one piece, well, that doesn't necessarily yeah, yeah. solve the problem. Yeah. OK. And this is why development doesn't work, because you stick one part of the picture in place, and you don't have all the rest of the parts. And, and even if you put in one part and the other parts, they have to work together in order for it to be functional. It's like you can't stick your heart in and your liver in and expect everything to work. You know? Okay. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Um, uh, I just want to know to what extent is this related to standards, especially when it comes to trade? Because um, I see this applicable to the case of Botswana beef industry. Uh, there is a, a, an a arrangement with the EU that a certain percentage of the beef that we export to the EU should be consumed within the country. Because their concern is that if we maintain certain standards for exports and other standards for local consumption, then the substandards may yeah, feel so I, 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 can't, I can't answer right now specific policy questions because we haven't done any analysis. Okay. But maybe we should. Let, let me keep going yeah, for just a little one, bit, one, one, right? One. There is one remark. Let me go on just a little bit, and then I'll. <coughs> I can proceed. Yeah, I can. Go ahead. Ask the question. Yeah. No, it was just you can't. You can't go ahead. It's, it's fine. Go ahead. It was just but uh, uh, one uh, point that I think uh, I don't know if you touched that, but in my view, particularly in the context of the type of country that you were mentioning, it would be uh, essential to consider, and it is uh, the role of uh, the, the, the loops. Uh, that you have uh, with natural resources Absolutely. and uh, also environmental Absolutely. impact and protection because that part uh, 
if you are depleting <laughs> the natural Absolutely. capital, yes. then that's an essential factor to take into consideration Absolutely. of the dynamics Absolutely. of the system. Okay, so now let me talk about two different pieces of strategy about policies, okay? So the first one is about the boundaries. So what is the purpose of boundaries? The purpose of boundaries is to protect domestic economic cycles, right? Enable developing new domestic cycles, right? So with, this is about the protection. Um, and balancing the links to the global economy with the internal dynamics. So we want the external links, but we want also the inter inter and, and the classic method in economics for doing this is exchange rates, right? Exchange rates don't always work for important reasons. So let's talk about that for a moment. So this is the model of exchange rates that works in, and I quote, ideal world. What you do is you have a set of possible exchange rates. So this is the value of the exchange rate. I've indicated one possible value here in red. And what you have is that if you move the exchange rate up in the, in the way I've defined this, then you would end up with unemployment because you have high cost of domestic labor. If you move it down, then you end up with employment because you have lower cost of domestic labor relative to the global labor market, and you have increasing GDP uh, because of that production. Uh, but let me show you how this relates to this issue of extractive economy dominance, right? The, the, the commodity dependent countries. Um, if you have this, then, and, and, and these two things, these two pieces are in some sense separated. <coughs> the labor and production costs and value of these two things are different. And so what we have is we have a, a readily available commodity, which has not yet been depleted, which if it couples to the global economy, the labor rates are worth paying. Okay? But we have another economy down here that would be producing all kinds of other things that would require a very different exchange rate. You understand? So there is a, there's like two different economies. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. With different effective labor rates. And so you cannot have the exchange rate in both places. What we would like to do therefore is to have some kind of heterogeneous policy. <coughs> you can imagine separating the extractive industry from the rest of the economy and having a different exchange rate for each. Um, it's not clear that that's practical. But in some sense, having different kinds of policies that are more <laughs> elaborate than just having a single exchange rate is really what this is all about. Is that clear? And many countries do that, right? For the, you know, different countries that are managing the exports import balance set up policies that are relevant for different parts of the economy. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, but would that relate, let's say, to someone who's digging the product out of the ground and exporting it raw, but running, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 value addition. What do you call it? In when you add, add value to the commodity. Right, so you exactly right. right. What is it? That's the next thing, so thank you. That was perfect. Uh, let me just say something about this. Um, the point is that it may not be enough. There are economies where costs, inherent costs, this is one of the understandings of why development doesn't take place in many places, is because in effect, the exchange rate that would have to happen is effectively negative, right? Because the existing costs make labor rates that would be competing with the global economy effectively negative, right? I don't know if that's clear why that's the case, right? There, because there are costs associated with them. All right. So, so the point is that how do we deal with this situation? At this point, I have to say, well, we have to analyze what's going on in order to figure out which policies are correct. It's not that I can give a standard policy. Yes. Um, so this is now going to your point about uh, value added and stuff. So what we want to do is we want to have 
in some sense, we recognize that there are two different kinds of economic activity. And what we want to do now is to leverage the this economic activity in order to create more of this kind of economic activity. Is that clear? Yes. I just have a problem with the maps on the previous slides. Yes. Uh, why the GDP is, is, is not changing with time? Why the GDP is not what? Changing with time in the red line. The this, this is, what, what this snapshot. is doing is is showing how GDP depends on exchange rate. At a particular moment. At a particular moment. I'm not incorporating the dynamics. But what it's, what it's trying to do is illustrate the exchange rate sensitivity mm -hmm. to the GDP. Right? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. As you did, right. okay, good. The absolute number of GDP, not the trend. Correct. Yeah. The absolute yeah, number. Absolute. Well, yeah. right, at a particular point in time. Right. So that's yeah. correct. So if we have these two economies, we can ask, what do we have to do in order to use one for the other? Um, yeah. Yes, there is a little bit of, uh, you know, in terms of there, you say GDP depends on the exchange rate. Yeah. Are you to call GNP or GDP? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the GDP is, you know, referred to the domestic production. Yeah. Yeah. Then the GNP is, a, is a domestic production plus external inflow. So services. both of them will depend upon the exchange rate. Yes. So you can plot both uh, of how them. How does GDP depend on it? Because GDP is the, the total value of things we need to collect. Correct, but it includes also the, the things that are created that are then exported. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. If that's, if that's the meaning of things. Okay. No, the, the point is just the following. That when you change the labor rates of the country relative to the global economy, you will change the economic activity. That's the only point. Okay, no, if you are taking into consideration the export value, it's okay. Yeah, it's, the other part of this is... But in, in, a, in an economy which is uh, um, um, autonomous, it's for take the case of the United States. The United economy States that's autonomous exports don't matter. Uh, uh, exchange rates don't I'm matter saying. at all. Okay, that's what I wanted to yeah, okay, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Good. absolutely. I think I think we are trying to say that he's only uh, Yanir is only bringing this, this up, not literally to include it into the limitless opportunity, the manifesto. But probably as a question that he has. No, 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 no. no. Let, let, let me but explain. you have about ten minutes. Yes. You don't mean I don't have limitless time? Yeah. <laughs> 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 we do. We have. It's part of the movement. <laughs> so the point is that um, if we want to use the. Um, the coupling to the global economy through the commodity exports to promote the domestic economic activity. Um, uh, we want to promote investment and diversified economic activity. Here's the key issue is the risks associated with the global economic activity. Okay. And so I want to point out what we did yesterday, which is we talked about the volatility of food prices. We talked a little bit about the volatility of energy prices, which now are again, you know, showing their volatility. Um, and, and just to point out the fundamental role of volatility in social systems. So this is, you know, if we have this all the time, then we're fine. If we have this all the time, then people are not there, right? If we have fluctuations between them, then things don't work out, okay? Because we try to adapt to this and then that happens. That doesn't work out. So um, the same thing applies when we have commodity volatility or volatility in general in the economic activity. So the point is that if the global commodity price volatility is high, that will cause similar problems in, in, in leveraging that for development. So um, in general, right, this is an under-diversified economy. Undiversified economy has volatility risks. 
and that leads to uh, problems with investment, okay? So we need to figure out how to stabilize this. Now, this is just a statement about the need to figure out the economic investment impacts of volatility. And there are various ways. This is, you know, there are, there are discussions of how volatility impacts on, on value of investment and how much one should invest. Um, what I put down here at the bottom is that the traditional theoretical frameworks also do not include non extreme events, right? They do not include not normal distributions. Um, and we really need to include them in order to understand what's going on. Um, all right, this I've really said. Um, so the policy advice here is the following. So let me go back. There are two different statements about policy that I want to make. Number one is that boundaries are important, and we have to tune the role of boundaries in order to enable development. The second is that we really need to quantify the risks associated with volatility, because by quantifying it, we also bound it. And when you don't know the extent of the risks, then they appear much even larger than they are. So this is something that we need to do. So here's the next step. What I've tried to do today is I've talked about kind of a generic framework in which we can understand the problems and opportunities of development. What we need to do is to build instantiated models, models of particular countries that enable us to understand what policies should be present. This is what we plan to do next, but we've not done. Now, here's the last statement. We actually have the opportunity to do this. We don't have enough funding to do this for everybody, but we have enough funding to do this for one country, basically. In, but just to give you a sense, to, to pay for the postdocs and students, just our expenses is several hundred thousand dollars, let's say half a million dollars of expenses to build the model, to analyze them in terms of policy implications, and to come up with specific policy recommendations. We currently have, we received an unrestricted grant um, that allows us to do this for one country, basically. So if anybody is available for collaborating on this, um, we need data. So we need financial flow data that presumably would be available to domestic banks. Um, and if we can get that data, we can construct this model quantitatively and, uh, and determine uh, policy recommendations. So I think that's really where we are. I, I spoke about um, the recommendations in terms of complex systems. We need to know the financial flows. We need to uh, understand the role of boundaries. We need to understand the role of volatility and uncertainty, uh, and uh, to do it for particular countries. And that's the first picture. Yes. Can you do it based on the current definition of GDP, or do you have to? GDP is not the variable we're going to look at. GDP is something that we can calculate from the model, but the model is going to represent the actual financial flow. So. It's, this is the point, that the traditional thinking starts from a couple of measures, GDP and unemployment. And that doesn't give you the right kinds of information to figure out what you uh, coming back uh, also to the previous statement, I'm thinking that if you're reasoning uh, on uh, policy advice uh, uh, in, in this analysis, uh, which I, I think is extremely interesting and valid, uh, 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 I would dedicate uh, part of it also to the analysis uh, related to the natural capital yeah. and the social impact. Because if you take into account only this economic value, the impact uh, could be disruptive in negative terms. Uh, and this is what's happening. For example, it's a very good take a lot of uh, particularly African countries today and with certain things. So that is absolutely critical. You cannot forget the link <coughs> with the natural capital and the social impact, uh, which can be analyzed exactly with the same approach, but yeah. need to be linked uh, in, the, in the dynamics. Yeah. Thank but, you very much. But, uh, the, uh, sometime in the 1970s, early 70s, the uh, limits to growth 
the yeah. modeling that was used at that time has been used at that time. Uh, we're concerned with similar sets. And uh, um, of course, what you portray now and what you're proposing is uh, based on a number of things that took place, like financial crisis in particular, with, uh, but also in relation to complex systems development. So it is, in fact, an application that you're trying to do to a kind of today type of understanding of how global economics might work well, in relation not, not to, no, not, not in relation to only an African country, because that is where is the problem, which I didn't agree with Is it in relation to any country? Right. That in is a developed country or any other country? In principle, this can be a model for <coughs> global economic uh, uh, development. That's, that's that is the value of it. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Yes, yeah. yes. Does the concept of resistance of evidence have a place in this analysis? Resistance of evidence. Yeah, when you talk about food, you know, their, their resistance levels in the stock market flows to the rest of the prices. So can that be built on the... It can be represented in the process, but the question that's always critical is, we can ask the, the question is, is it going to be relevant to the, the question that we're asking? In principle, yeah. well, could I just ask? Uh, yeah. Most of your models are looking at um, natural flows or country flows. Uh, a lot of the uh, people in this room have been trying to relate to regional yeah, activity exactly right. um, because uh, shared shared uh, standards bodies, shared uh, facilities, and laboratories going into one country doing work in another country. So um, it's really only a question of, of the what data we have yeah. so that we can analyze the uh, structure of the, of the system. Yeah. Sorry, that was exactly my question. Could okay. it be applied to our uh, single market? For Absolutely. <laughs> Any other questions? Because I think, I, I think I'm going to get the hook pretty soon. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you are now concentrating on commodities. No. As after after the financial stock market has crashed, and you are trying to bring in the GDP in relation to exchange rate and commodity prices, is it a move to move from the financial stock market phantom wealth to attack the commodity prices and create more speculation there? So that there is more destabilization of production on the ground. So, so there are policy. <laughs> yeah. There are policy issues that you're raising. There are policy issues that you're raising that we've been raising for the last, you know, six years or so, and they have to do with the statement that the policy about how markets are being structured is affecting detrimentally the dynamics of the global commodity system. This is something that we are pushing on, but that's a global policy. It's U.S. policy, European policy. Um, here, what we're doing is we're trying to say, whatever the outside system is doing, what are the country policies that will enable effective uh, survival and thriving uh, in the existing circumstances? So, so, so where we to take South Africa, Malcolm? What do you feel about that? We have data. The reason why I suggested is because we are having smart partnership dialogue in South Africa and all that. There is plenty of data. It depends what data they require. Right. Well, we need financial flow data, transaction data. It's not enough to have GDP. And, uh, They're not typical data. Right? But what do you feel? What do you feel the concept? No, I'm not to answer your question directly, but I was going no. to ask in terms of the balancing and the boundaries. Yes. Aren't the options or the policy options skewed by the rules of the game at the international level? Through WTO, the EPA, Absolutely. 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 So the point is that once one understands the direction that one needs to go, then one has to navigate the geopolitical yeah. context. Yeah. But at least you have an understanding of what you need to do in order to achieve the outcome that you want to. What do you, because you have a different set of rules for different countries, so like the United States can have a massive debt load 
and no one really cares. I mean, people are still investing in the U.S. stock market well, around the world. What I'm doing is I'm analyzing, I'm analyzing from the point of view of a particular country in this country. <coughs> Analyzing the global system, and we have projects with each country will have a different set of rules that will be applied by the global system. Right. Too. And so, what we need eventually is a global strategy that enables all parties to develop. And that's that's the win-win smart partnership approach, which this kind of analysis enables us to develop. Which we do. This kind of analysis, <laughs> this analysis <laughs> yes. enables us to do it. Okay? Other questions? I don't know whether I'm getting a hook yet, but if you have other questions. I'm happy to talk with anybody who wants to discuss the practical details. Again, the practical details have to do with that was arranging. How practical yeah. is this? Yeah. I was asking how practical is this in the, in the globalizing world? As soon as we have, as soon as we have the access to the data, uh, it will be about six months before we have preliminary results and about two years before the effort will be uh, completed. And, and then you will discover what? We'll discover what are the directions of policy interventions that are needed in order to promote domestic control. Because my, my question is whether you yeah. anticipate what you discover will be what you well, it's a walkability of, of what you discover. But every country is like a boat on a sea. Yeah. Right. They all have but different shapes. It's not a zero-sum game. I know. They all have different shapes, and they're all bobbing on the sea when everybody else is. Some of them are underwater shooting at you, but that's another story. That's right. But they all have different structures. Now, if you try, as you say, you can't impose the same rules on No, them. but that's exactly the point. That's why I can't tell you what to do before I look at the video. You know, you're going to select one of those boats, as it were. Exactly. We have to extrapolate from that. No, 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 we're, we're not, not going to extrapolate from that. You, we're going to then be able to get data from other places. Okay. We're not going to see how it is. Exactly. exactly. So you are it's an interesting to get contrast. That's right. To make the entire framework, we have to have all the data together. But in the meantime, we have this discussion. Yeah. Uh, you had a question. Yes, you ended with a very good sentence. Not one size fits all. Yes. Uh, did you, is this, as somebody has asked, applicable across it's the applicable world? The framework yes. is applicable to everybody, but the results depend upon what we obtain when we do the analysis. Because here I'm just saying, you know, this is kind of what an economy looks like, but each economy is different. So we have to be able to put in the numbers and say what's going on in a particular economy in order to figure out what interventions are. So you can't take the results from one economy? No, no, no. no, 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 no. That's could, the whole could, could I not necessarily take the hook, but trying to say that? <laughs> um, I think this is quite an extraordinary um, kind of situation we happen to be faced with in relation to understanding a bit more the limit or the limitless of, uh, you can still see Tian Yan, okay. you're part of us. The thinking is this, because I'm glad Catherine is here. And I did refer, maybe you have a sister, if you feel like. I'm sorry, um, he still wants a word question, so I'm the, going to he can tell you other computer. Oh. Uh, there will be so many questions because that particular presentation that you offered to us, which probably, as you said, rightly so, there isn't yet, it isn't yet, <coughs> it is in making. That's correct. Is, is, it reminds me, I'm, I'm a global room member. And remind me very much again of um, Catherine is here, probably reminded her too, of the making of limits to growth model. And uh, I think it probably came in a similar way. There are a number of heads of government, a number of people concerned and quite enlightened with trying to pick up the mood of what was taking place in 1970 based on the methodological available at that time. 
modeling, dynamic modeling, Jay Forrester. We have the limits to growth there. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the <coughs> those people were part of it. In particular, Alice King is part of the founders of our group. And the reason why is because that idea continued to follow, to, to, to be built into what, how the world and the global interactions um, developed, including in relation to the modeling and the methodology that we had. And it was quite controversial at the beginning how among the Club of Rome, initial Club of Rome members, we became Club of Rome uh, more or less visible after the report was published. And it was, it articulated for the first time issues to do with environment. And it was considered as a, a, a kind of special moment in the global context mm. because of the robust modeling that it supported as a methodology at that time. Now it may be that for the last so many years, 20, 30 years, this group of ours emerged without necessarily, as uh, some say, without necessarily a specific explicit aim, but there is a resonance that is built up, a synchronization in a different mode, but similar to those who were so-called Club of Rome. And not surprising, quite, quite a number of Club of Rome members currently are still part of this group. And uh, there is probably a possibility through this particular, but maybe <coughs> further developed, to include a way to understand how we include smart partnership type of tenants that we have at the moment much more explicit. Not explicit like this smart partnership in, in the, but the, 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 the things, the, the wisdom that we reached in the last 30 <coughs> years. Because it is what we're trying to say, a complex adaptive <coughs> system. It is about the fact that, although I said that this uh, presentation, as you mentioned to me, is not a presentation only for those in African countries or developing countries, told me that is also U.S. <coughs> department government, U.S. is interested in this. Every country would be interested in this kind of policy insights and policy advice. Who wouldn't be? But in our context, even more so, if you look at the fact that most of the countries are dependent on commodities, even, even more so of a case that one would at be attracted to this. And if you think in terms of what Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir at that time, when he articulated together with colleagues from Secretary uh, Masira, President Mandela was there, President Chisano, President Miyoma, and all the founders, of, what they were trying to say is that uh, there is a need for a, <coughs> a, 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 a trying to deal with the commodities in a way that it comes back into the country. Now, this is what you're trying to kind of put together into your model based on complex adaptive systems. What we did say since Kasane onwards is that there is this map partnership that we need to quantify, whatever that is. Some said it's intellectual equity, whatever that, however that mm -hmm. can be portrayed. Uh, but there is this thing yeah. that needs to be portrayed into this complex adapti adaptive system. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I think, again, uh, we're very privileged that you're trying to, you, you, you stimulate us and you invite us to be part of an experiment which might be <coughs> of a similar nature, like the limits to growth <coughs> happened in 1972. I don't, Catherine, <coughs> does that resonate to you further? It certainly resonates, and I, I remember the adverse publicity when it first <laughs> came out. Sure. Yeah. And I don't know if, if anyone has actually measured the impact of what it did. I know that they're revisiting it now. Yeah. Um, and I'd be, be quite interested to know how they're approaching it, given yeah. the, the new methods that they could use. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was interesting. But I, I think this highlights, to me, the sort of simplicity of the That's current economic models. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would have thought that anyone would want improvement uh, on that side, irrespective of what you could do in terms <coughs> of, of policy, because it's very difficult to 
uh, give policy recommendations of one country because yeah. every country is involved. Yeah. That's right. you, yeah. uh, and it would require you to do that for every country, almost. Although that would help you with your model for the future where, mm -hmm. and I, I think it was really very, very exciting. And I, felt, there is probably I felt the enthusiasm, I felt, yeah, you know, with the limits to growth sort of approach. Catherine, probably want to mention the kind of similar uh, problems in a way, or similar reaction to most of the governments and uh, whatever to the limits to growth, even today. Yes. It yes. was specifically not to the issues that they were included in, which created an um, ongoing dialogue and developed new, but it was particularly with the modern. So w the kind of question you ask were about the modern, and I don't think we had enough background to understand systems approach to follow him. And that is what will happen with any other kind of, if we are trying to get together, for instance, some of that, I asked Mark, some of the data that is required either for the uh, financial flow, either from the central bank, or from the governor, or from whatever kind of uh, institution that we have, those individuals who are, have to understand complex systems, Otherwise, you'll have similar problems like we had with, yeah. and there may be others, the Club of Rome's report. Even today, mm -hmm. the model is one attacked and, at, uh, and looked at rather than the actual uh, uh, content of what he wanted to achieve. It's very simple, but that being said, the system and complexity has to be understood by those who are engaged in. Otherwise, we put questions or we feel like guinea pigs. Yeah? So that's why we said the smart partnership has to be somehow part of it. Please. If one is to talk about sort of organizational structure and issues, then I could move into that. A, a, a bit later. A, a bit, bit later. later. So Just let, to let, finish let me off, answer this because question. Because I don't know if it's connected and if colleagues know about so, uh, financial uh, crisis. It, how many of you are familiar with Nassim Taleb's work on black swans and uh, the financial crisis? So is everyone familiar with it? Yeah, we all have it. Great. So yesterday I spoke about the tail events, remember these extreme yeah. events mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that happened because we have these fat tail distributions due to dependencies in the system. So Nassim Taleb, during the financial crisis, he, his experience was from Lebanon, you know, seeing the, the, the Lebanese society falling apart after it was stable for many years. So he had this idea that people don't expect crises that are going to take place. They think that the past history is a good indication of the future, and it's not. And so he bet against the market before the financial crisis and won big. And since then, he's been writing books to explain the idea that one has to be prepared for unexpected. Um, uh, so this idea that you, you cannot take for granted Mm. that things are going to be present. So the idea of the black swan is that you see a hundred swans and they're all white. So you think that black swan, white swans are the way things are. And then once you see a black swan, it totally changes your picture. And the financial crisis was a, was a case in point. Now, um, <coughs> what he has focused on since then on the, on, as a matter of public good is that the society has to prepare itself and the way it should prepare itself is by becoming what he calls anti-fragile, which is that you are able to withstand That's the point. extreme That's events, the even point. benefit from them. That's the point. Okay. Yeah. Now, in order to do that, you have to create a system of a particular type. But um, even if you want a system to be robust, when we're talking about global connectivity and the fact that it creates vulnerability, so if you ha how can we make it less vulnerable. Well, we have to introduce some circuit breakers, some you know barriers to propagation, and so on and so on. So yeah. he and I, let me just finish, it'll take me a couple of moments in the moment. Um, he and I both agree that it's really important to create a system which structurally is robust, which structurally, if possible, is anti-fragile, but fundamentally, 
has the property that it is not going to collapse the minute something happens. And currently our system is not that way. We are extremely yeah. vulnerable. Right. right. The other side of it is that by analyzing and, and, and characterizing the dependencies, we can do two things. We can intervene in constructive ways, and we can create systems of intervention, systems of response <coughs> for crises. So one direction is to make a system that is robust to extreme events. The other direction is to make a system that can respond effectively at the beginning of an extreme event in order to prevent it from cascading into large steel failure. Nassim and I both share focus on the first. I'm also engaged in the second. So there are different kinds of things that are going on. Yes? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I don't know when I say question. Um, I just want to make a comment. Uh, the topic is very, very interesting. But at the same time, highly technical and complex. Yes. <laughs> With so many dynamics, to the extent that some people get lost, which are the dynamics is the main focus, mm -hmm. the central problem. Um, this, this, this is a problem of perception. When a topic is highly complex, Diversify mm -hmm. a critical form of perception. In other words, everybody is thinking that this is the most important dynamic of the presentation and so forth. It's like the problem of uh, the seven blind men and he is telling. No, they were asked to go and talk about the Yeah. Seven men. Well, some talk you know, some talk is the detail, some talk is the yes. best. And when they came back for the debriefing, Okay, describe what a million fan is. The person who told the nose said, let the person on the nose. And that is what it is. The person who told the tail, let the person. So it is normal that uh, for such a very interesting and complex, complicated issue, there should be some of these questions and so on. So, can we, is it possible that we can just give all the central trust, a summary of what the, 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 the presentation is about? So. <laughs> so here is the here is the point. Here is the point. Here is the point. If we arranged the appropriate time, I could speak continuously for several weeks. Okay. He needs he needs to brief his excellency, the president. Oh, I see. Let me answer your question. No, no, I want to answer your question. I've been doing this for 25 years, more than 25 years. When I started making presentations on this subject, I refused to speak about it for less than a semester. Okay, Really, I wouldn't do it. But the crux of the question that you're asking is the following. There is an opportunity now to go beyond the standard economic model and the standard consensus about policy. In order to do so, we need information about economic behavior of a country so that it can be turned into policy in related information. It's not going to set the policy, it will inform the policy. Given the right information, we can do this, and that's the crux of the situation. Okay. Uh, yeah. Please. No, no, no. <coughs> no, no. Is that helpful? This, this, is, uh, this is the first time as a group uh, we are looking at this particular We're engaging. Yeah. Yes. We have touched. Uh, we have touched on other economic uh, aspect, financial inclusion and all that. But uh, this part of it is is new. But it is not. Uh, it is not something foreign to many of us, because when you talk about the boundaries, you talk about vulnerability. We have been. This is part of the so-called globalization movement, and uh, my prime minister, my. My boss, the former prime minister, was very wary about this globalization yes. because globalization was being pushed by certain interest group exactly. to break down uh, to break down country yeah. barriers for their own benefit. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And Dr. Mahade has been very wary about this. Yeah? That's number one. 
Number two, uh, during the uh, financial crisis where we suffered from, and uh, Dr. Mahade was the black swan in this case, <laughs> because he put up <laughs> exchange values, <laughs> and they told him he was a really bad, bad guy, yeah. for doing this against the flu. Yes. So this is something that exactly. I thought is the basis of what you are trying to do. It's not something new, exactly right. but yeah. it's the same thing. This I'm trying to, so to get to you, yes? Yeah. So if we can do something about this, if we are brave enough to pick this up as another aspect of our activity moving forward, in whatever way I, I'm not sure it is, this can be very, very useful. Because it's just enforcing that uh, something, an idea that comes from the West normally, for the benefit of the West normally, is being pushed for the rest of the world to accept. What we are he's trying to say here is that look look at this, this is different. There are not 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 one solution fits all. That was his possible. <coughs> I think that's what we are trying to do. And I support this. Yeah. And you can use Dr. Mahade as the black swan where everyone everybody else was white. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 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 my, my question was with regards to the, the role of uh, the World Bank, IMF, in advising our governments as to how to go about doing things, and they end up giving negative results from the anticipated results that we, we were hoping to get by following the, the, the advice given from these international world organizations which um, we are forced to comply with. So, you want me to address it. So, my statement is the following. The conventional economics is working with the institutions that are advocating for their own benefit. Um, what I am trying to do is to create a new fundamental basis for economics for two reasons. Number one, because we should be able to understand economics better than the traditional thing. But the second is because indeed in order to solve problems in the world, in order to improve what's happening in the world, we need that understanding. So these are not separate goals. And I am prepared with the theory and with the data and with the results to strongly oppose the uh, big institutions. I have been doing this in many contexts uh, until now, showing that the real science is different from the conventional science. Yeah. And that we really need to, um, to shift views. And the fact, and I said before, I said the first thing that I said when I talked about <coughs> <coughs> you already understand dependencies. You already have the intuition about many of the things that the science that has been uh, studied until now doesn't have. The opportunity of complex system science is to put that into a scientific framework. And, and this is what we are doing. Excuse me. Yeah, I'm sorry to this is sorry. Um, I find it very interesting to especially the complementary information given by Omar. Uh, what we are trying to do here is we are giving a paradigm shift. There was a paradigm up to the end of the Cold War which ushered in globalization. Globalization was considered to be a paradigm shift from the Cold War paradigm to the new paradigm. Now, but what Omar is trying to emphasize is that that, that globalization paradigm from what your presentation indeed there should be a shift but again the experience shows that people are very 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 reluctant to shift to change their mentalities and attitudes and methods in the paradigm so i think what we can do is you've already told us there's a new city there's a new paradigm coming up what to what omar said how then what policy advice will we give for developing countries to shift to adapt themselves to new paradigm as uh, omar just said <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. I will write your question. How is this model that you have uh, written in the context of very small economies like small island Europeans? Um, 
Our experience today is that the so, so the question is important because the approach um, is about understanding the aggregate behavior and not about understanding individual behavior. And so in principle, it will be more effective in larger aggregates. But the experience that we have is that even fairly small aggregation enable it to be effective. The point is it captures the, the largest scale behavior. And the issue of setting boundaries and so on is really a large scale issue. It's not about individual action. Um, it's about policy action that involve individuals. But it's not about, you know, what you ate for lunch. So um, I do think that it will apply even to small countries. Isn't it the outcome of, as you say, globalization of knowledge that we never connected into the whole global knowledge picture previously because we couldn't get there? Now, to a large degree, we see more through Google or whoever. We are all getting a better view of the situation. And you are saying, as I understand it, we have a statistical model, if you like, which we're all working on. There is more data which will allow us to refine how we analyze our position and how we go forward. Absolutely. Is that not what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I am reacting to the question of small and big economies. Whatever is big was small. Whatever goes up comes down. Whatever boils cools. Now, we boil our minds with a lot of intellectualism and academic developmental programs that end up being very costly <coughs> and failing at a very high cost when it is already too late. Small is that every human being, every village, every state is trying to survive against all odds. And against the odds of the big, against the small. That's the natural law. The law of survival. So I'd like all those who are thinking are small to look at every model for their own sake, not in relation to who is big and who is small. So that if a scientific discovery is made, it should be looked at in who is using it best. It should be looked at in how can I make the best of a bad situation. If you know Diana Rose's song, making the best of a bad situation. <laughs> because there is a very bad situation everywhere. Every cell, wherever it lives, is trying to survive in its own environment. Now, in all this model, one question comes. What puts us together? And you mentioned it, environmental or climate volatility. Where whatever programs you are making, something comes around and it crashes. Nature tries to crush all those uh, academic models. So I would like to suggest that whoever thinks small, don't think small. <laughs> think bigger than you think you are being told you are small. And then we shall catch up somewhere. <laughs> I, I do think that, uh, could I declare that uh, the session that we were trying to kind of, not the session, but the uh, uh, from a smarter nation to a smarter globe, radically new approach, this was part of it. So we are already in, uh, uh, beyond the uh, uh, kind yeah. of limitless opportunities, the first session, it was a seemingly kind of smooth uh, kind of uh, transition without we realizing, and that proves the point why <coughs> actually it's very artificial to say from nine to five we talk about this, from five to six we talk about this, because everything is interconnected or interdependent on the other things.